a bump in the road jerked me awake. I blinked heavily. The day was still in its prime, as I could see the sun through the trees beyond the backseat window. We're almost here, son. I rubbed my eyes and sat up from my brief slumber. Dad was twiddling with the radio idly. A sweet tune crackled into life. My feet swung tenderly several inches from the floor of the car. I smiled as my dad hummed along in a squeaky tone. His throat let out creaks and groans as he strained to hit higher notes. My mom sighed mockingly at him, pulling the steering wheel to bring us around a swift corner. As we hit another bump, I hear a faint jingling sound. What was that? I asked. My dad turned slightly. His hand reached down the neck of his shirt. He pulled out what looked like an army recruiting tag. I had seen ones like it on television, when I had been allowed to stay up to watch the occasional war film. He handed it to me from the passenger seat. On closer inspection, I realized it wasn't a dog tag, though it was a beaded metal chain that went with one. Hanging from it was an intricate metal emblem. It looked only like swirls and curves to me. In the center were the words, for now and always, Sharon. I rubbed it in my palm. I realized Mom had given it to Dad for his birthday. It was one of those presents that they hadn't told me about, because it was for them. A gift from her to him. I didn't mind that, and so I said nothing more about it. I handed it back. Dad slipped it on again and I smiled to myself, thinking about the two of them being all slushy. As a young boy, I was of course reserved in my understanding of love. I wasn't yet aware of the varieties that were out there. I only knew there was that of my closest family. As we sat there on the journey home, I thought about what it would be like when I got home. It had been busy a few days prior to the present. Choosing a cake for Dad had been a challenge for me, as I had not known of his appreciation for sports, tied between golf and football. I had inevitably chosen the football-shaped cake, feeling it was the safest choice after consulting with my mother. The celebration had been a pleasing one, if not a little secluded for me. I had pounced on my dad the moment the clock struck eight as he lay in bed beside mom. I had watched as he unwrapped his presents, a dark tie, a coffee mug, imprinted with a joke I did not understand, but one which nevertheless seemed to put my dad in a fit of chuckling. Finally, he opened his cards. He always did the cards last. One for me and mom, handcrafted by yours truly. He would smile, a sweet smile, as mom leaned across and kissed him on the cheek. The rest of the day would consist of us padding around in our pajamas. I would bob around for most of the day before retiring to my bedroom in the evening for dinner. There I would draw, read one of my latest books given to me by my mom. They were cookbooks. I'd been pestering my mom one day when she was cooking, and her reluctance to humor me after several minutes must have drove her to provide me with the nearest reading material at hand. Try these out, she told me. It'd be good for you to learn a thing or two. She grinned at me and I brustled along, preoccupied with chocolate-covered thoughts of baking. The car eventually pulled into our driveway, and I sighed, reminiscing of the nature walk earlier that day. My triumph when finding a frog in the footpath had pleased me to no end, especially when my dad had crouched down beside me and suggested that I carry it to a lake farther afield. Seeing his grin and that boyish sparkle in his eye made me churn with pleasure. I always felt that despite of being an only child. I had the very best substitute for a brother. My dad was the best of both for me. I did not see him as one or the other. Even when he was tired and not in the mood to play with me, he would always have a certain glimmer in his eye that kept me comforted. I felt it wouldn't be long before his next burst of energy, and this kept me patient between our activities. The three of us stretched as we exited the car. The light was beginning to fade from the sky, and the chill was descending. We marched to our door puffing clouds as Dad fumbled for the key. We shuffled in through the door. Neither of our neighbors were around to spout greetings and postpone my parents' arrival inside. Mom pushed the door and locked it, and we hung up our coats in the closet. I flicked off my shoes and headed into the living room, but Dad had beaten me to it. He slumped into his usual space on the sofa and turned the television to the news program. I expelled a huff as I trudged to the spot on the other sofa. I never liked the news. 
Mom followed me in and curled up next to my dad. It is at this point that I chose to directly address the reader. Up to this point, I have recalled the majority of what seems like an ideal day in the life of a young boy. That so far is the case. Sadly, this is not a mere recollection of my memories, or better days gone by. This is a declaration, one of which I have devoted my entirety of my well-being to. As I write my life's greatest climax, my hands shake upon the page. This is due mainly to the age of my current self. Of course, there are other reasons behind my condition too, but all of this is to come. Just be hesitant, because if you proceed, you face only a consequence, one which I myself have no shame in inflicting upon you. I felt I was beginning to grasp certain aspects of my parents' body language. As time went on, I was picking up on characteristics of their more secluded nature. As a child of eight, I was usually buzzing with some sort of energy throughout the day. However, when it came to nighttime, I always had some nervous reservations. It wasn't clear to me at the time, but I was a very clingy boy at that age. When it came to new experience beyond the range of my parents, I always struggled. This didn't get to me, because my parents never emphasized on the matter or made me feel bad about it. Don't get me wrong, I did try to get on with other kids at school, and try new clubs, and all that and broaden my horizons when it came to leaving the house and go explore. These things were just a bit of a challenge for me, as can be understood for such a primal age. Unfortunately, unknown to me then, I was somewhat lacking in the ability to advance in my independence. I clung to my parents in the face of the uncertain, even in some trivial cases. One of these cases was the nighttime routine. Apparently, I had always had a poor relationship with the darkness. My mom told me about the time I cried in my cot for five hours at their bedside, despite over six separate sessions of nursing me back to sleep. This was a regular routine for them when I was in infancy, according to mom. I guess that part of our mental wiring can stick with us longer than naturally intended. At least, that's how I try to see it. I can't help but feel weakness and shame. Looking back now, of course. But back then, I was just glad to have my parents around the next corner, at all times. I looked up at the clock across from the television. It was coming to half nine. This was close to normal time for my lights out. I swiveled my gaze towards mom and dad. They were very tired. Mom stirred, rising up in her seat and stretching her arms out. Dad rubbed his eyes, standing up. He went to reach for the remote. I think it's about time now, there, Squirt. I stared at the pale light of the television. The heating was now dying down now, and a slight chill was creeping up on me. Mom gazed over as she headed for the doorway. She seemed to be thinking. You know, you can stay up for a little while longer if you want. Suddenly, my mind froze. They were off the bed, upstairs. I wasn't particularly tired. My palms were already clammy from the mixed temperatures of the room. Somehow, the distance between me and them seemed to slowly double. I looked down at the floor between me and them. Cold light threw along the shadows and across the carpeted floor. The breeze outside beginning to amplify. Rustling leaves were now assortment of jagged masses scraping their way towards the door. My dad saw my face going pale. I had not yet answered them. I felt alone, perched on the sofa by myself. I heard my dad exhale from his nose. I knew what that meant. I knew I was disappointing them both again. But at that point, I cared not for fear of leaving. And then I knew what that meant. I knew I was disappointing them both again. But at that point, I cared not for fear of them leaving and even closing the door behind them. I swallowed again. I was so focused on them that I spotted my dad's head tilt slightly lower than before. These signs are becoming clearer to me throughout each month. However, despite my understandings of the frustrations I caused, I still pursued them. It was a pathetic move on my part. 
one that I followed through one time too many. I shudder thinking about how little time they must have had together when I began to develop over the years. I was a full-time burden on them, more so than most of the children my age. My mom leaned in the doorway, giving me an, oh, come on then, look. I rose to my feet and followed behind them, making sure I was not the last to reach the top. The upstairs light was flickered on as I went to turn on my own. My bedroom lay before me, as semi-tidy as ever. My books and toys were along both sides, both simply scraped to the edge to remove them from the main floor space. Having them already brushed my teeth, I moved over to the bed and climbed in. Rustling from the bathroom drew close, and my mother padded into the room to see me off to sleep. I brushed aside several toys and sat down on my bedside, causing me to roll in towards her slightly. I took the opportunity to have one more intoxicating embrace with her. The warmth of her hug dissolved me as my insecurities slipped away. Lying back on the mattress, my eyes drew shut as my mother planted a tender kiss on my cheek. What a high that gave me. Internally, my body fluttered as I began to drift steadily into a sweet, sweet slumber. My bed creaked slightly, and I felt the weight of her fade away. Far off, I hear the sound of my door closing. My mind seems to swirl in out of consciousness, sweeping over an impossible landscape of vast beauty. I'm free once more. Free of fear or phobia. From guilt. I feel the presence of the two closest to my heart holding me up, carrying me across this plane. What bliss I do taste in my undeveloped soul. This tranquil world consumes me for what I will always remember as an eternity. An eternity I wish could have ended there. It seems there was a different plan for me. Up ahead, in my mind's eye, I saw an approaching mass. It was hard to define, as was any part of this dream. We often forget our dreams, be it in an instant, upon waking, or gradually over time. But some can stick. This one has, due to circumstances that follow. In my mind, an unseen force pulls me into a new realm. The hazy comfort around me is becoming tinted with gray, and the darkness starts to enclose me. I materialize arms and legs so I might fend off the hostility. I'm on my back, staring up into a sky scarred with tears and that are now consuming the light. My body squirms and I attempt to flee. Something holds me down. I cannot rise. From beneath me, I feel the ground begin to crumble. It shakes and cracks, and I feel lumps pushing into me, as the world takes on a new form. I'm kicking out an ever-shrinking womb, and it has no intent of protecting me, and I try to scream, but the void takes away my voice. The ground rumbles, and I finally gasp into the real world. The shaking in my mind withers. My heart fluctuates, and my hands clench the bedsheets. I stare up at the bedroom ceiling, my eyes bulging and my body shaking. Am I truly awake? Of this I am uncertain. I bump in the mattress jerked my attention. The twist in my head, the side. It takes a minute or two for me to realize. My body shook, but it was not me that was shaking. Looking down. I see the bed I lie in. It is juddering, and I judder with it. I convulsed beneath me, my spine jerked with the thrust of the surface. It began riddling me with furious pumps of force. I clasped the edges of the covers in my hands. I dare not open my eyes now. It's a violent outburst that grew in the... Its violent outbursts grew in intensity until I was rising and falling non-stop, and it terrified me to my core. How was this even possible? I let out a whimper. But under the ferocious rumpling of the mattress, it was drowned out. It sounded as if tearing was beginning to emerge from its unnaturally loud symphony. I begged at the darkness within my eyelids that this soul-destroying event would cease all existence. 
I prayed to be spared, but with each moment, each torturous twist and jolt grew stronger. I began to ache. My body ached as much as my mind. I felt like I was going to pass out or burst from the fear. To be utterly helpless in the face of the complete unknown is an experience I do not wish upon anybody. I did not yet know it, but this close quarter invader was not as alien to me as I feared. Never again do I vow to speak of these circumstances, for as I write this, my heart bleeds and my soul splits. I sit here alone, not daring to think of it. It's been too many years. If I was to dwell beyond these words that I condemn to you, I would not last another night on this earth. My mind, my heart, can take it no more. From here on, the burden of this recollection rests on you. The ends of the mattress jerked up and down. The lumps were changing. No longer was it any way soft. I felt penetrating angles in my back. They seemed to surface beneath the material of the mattress. Gritty textures rub against me. A spring cried out as it gave me another strain. My heart was now in my mouth. I gargled a cry for help. Through tears, I finally dared squint to my doorway. My false hope drove me to seek out my father. Never in all my life have I been so internally desperate for his aid. Why could they not hear me? A dark sadness broke me that night. I shrunk back into the past. I was smaller. I was afraid. I was powerless. I cried. I cried for my mom. I cried for my dad. My arms trembled as I hugged myself. I felt so cold. In that moment, I was greeted by a new feeling beneath me. Warmth touched my shoulders. It traveled at a disturbing speed to the base of the mattress. Now there was a source of heat curdling around my body. It seemed to gush between spaces, creating pockets of denser intensity. The whole mattress felt liquid. It still accommodated jagged protrusions and solid lumps, but now it seemed to have encased them in partially jellified substance. The heat made this infinitely unpleasant. It was at that point, after seemingly hours of mind-warping terror, that I finally salvaged the courage to remove myself. I kicked out sideways, flicking my duvet away from my legs. I kicked out sideways. As I sat up, I flung over again. The sheets vibrated off the bed. I followed, sitting up a second time to finally throw myself toward and off the end of the bed. In the darkness, my foot struck a post of the bed and my struggle to escape its range. My hands scrambled for the door. All the while, my bed groaned. It moaned and twisted. The frame thudded against the carpeted floor. It seemed to contain some animalistic rage. I turned from the wall and pressed my body against it as tightly as possible as I stared upon it wholly for the first time. I was given a full view of the spectacle. It was as if I was watching a creature, decapitated and free of limbs. The body writhed on the bed frame as it contorted into horrific, lively poses. The surface was beginning to stain. Even in the dull slits of the night coming from my blinds, I cannot depict the details of a liquid seeping through the seams. A churning rose up over the muffled croaking of the fabric. To my dread, I could see the mattress swelling up, and it took on a hunched posture as the center rose up from the bed frame. Eventually, the stitching began to give out at the corners. Spurts of warm liquid leaked through the slits of the floor. Spittle licked at my bare legs. I screamed. I did a rapid dance trying to shake off the substance, but I dared not touch it with my hands. I squealed out for mom and dad. I yelled at them with high volume. Somehow the door handle evaded my reach. I kept searching with my fingertips. I was too afraid to look away from the spewing sack of fluids. It had a presence. It seemed angry. My hands scraped at the paintwork as I searched, relying only on my sense of touch to guide me. I felt something cold. Finally, I grasped the handle tightly. As I did this, the atmosphere changed. 
I swear the temperature rose by several degrees. Right in front of me, before my eyes, I saw the bulk of the mattress rise up. It arced backwards, towering above me. The noise droned in my ears. A deep and heavy moan bounced off my walls, and inside my head, it sounded almost vocal. Like a person groaning from immense abdominal pain. As I cried out, it shook hideously. The ground vibrated under my feet. The desk knocked against the wall. The lamp fell on its platform. My hand, having been immobile for this seemingly infinite moment, jerked downward. The door beside me wrenched open. Light from the hallway poured in and filled the edges of the room. To my devastation, the mattress let out a final piercing cry of a soaring pitch. Its dripping mass was suspended before me. The twitching and writhing suddenly ceased before the whole form collapsed, coming to rest motionless on my bed frame. Dust rose up in the ray of light. I turned on my heels and ran to my room. I reached to my parents' door. The door was a crack open. Charging it aside, I burst into the room at the foot of their bed. My throat was dry and my eyes were puffed, and I was blurred of vision. My fingers gripped their sheets as I wheezed. I had shouted for them all the way down the hallway, and I still panted for them, saying their names over and over, but I focused on the bed, at the spaces where they would lay each night. My heart sank. My courage shrunk away as I gaped at that empty space ahead of me. The sheets were crumpled, similar to the way they were in my room, on mornings when I was too tired to maintain them once I dressed for school. They looked unfamiliarly messy. I knew Mom would never have left them in that state. Even when rising for a late night bathroom visit, she would always have the corner of the duvet folded over. My dad had told me humorously one evening. He joked that she would always have a high maintenance in the bedroom and that it was always unwise to ever leave an unmade bed. The bed was in her centerpiece, and she would always have it in a fashion that would welcome her on her return each night. The state it was in was not dramatically visual, but it unsettled me. The covers were still on the bed. They had not been thrown off in a rush, nor had they been left unattended. They were rumpled in pieces, where they both should have been sleeping. I edged around to the side that my dad slept on and tugged down on the covers. Their shapes imprinted on the mattress ever so slightly, but that's all I could see. The lining of the mattress was also rumpled. What is going on? My breathing was starting to calm down a little as I paddled around the bed. Dazed in disbelief, the house was silent. The only mild comfort was the hallway light peering into my parents' room, and my own. I looked back into the passage. Could they have gone downstairs? I crept step by step into the dim light. My feet stopped at the edge of the stairs. I could still see them on the bottom, but there was no hint of life. The only sounds came from me, from my heart still in my mouth. Sweat cooled on my forehead, as well as a tad bit of saliva on my cheek. I wiped my face with the sleeve, while standing idly at the top, staring down at the dreary darkness. For some internal reason, I had no urge to call out for them. The house seemed to be filled with absence. It's hard to explain. It was like being stuck in a negative pressure. It felt that there was less of the space. I know how ridiculous this may sound to you. I know what I felt that night. Had I known what lay in the store only moments away, I probably would have run from the house. Sadly, I knew nothing of what truth sat from mere meters of me. This night was, and still is, the ultimatum of my life, which will never spare me a moment of peace. Never again would I exist in reality. To this day I have not slept, dreamt, nor truly lived for a single moment of my decreasing existence. I am but a shell, a shell of a boy once broken.
The air was cold to the taste. There seemed to be a faint breeze that only struck me as it passed my lips and hit the back of my throat. It cooled my mind for a passing second. A final comfort, unbeknownst to me. My head turned once again to my room. Images of distorted surfaces and oozing innards scraped my sanity. My hand trembled of its own accord by my side. A musky taint came through the opening of the doorway. It seemed to fog up the entrance, marginally. It was beginning to produce an aroma. My nostrils caught a hint of something. My heart hit the roof of my rib cage. I had no idea what it was. All I knew is that it was the most foulest stench I had ever endured. In a trance, I turned myself toward the doorway. My foot stretched out and it made progress toward it. Another step followed. My upper body did not move. I glided in slow motion into the mist. My lips sealed back up as the wave gained strength. They triggered flashbacks of the jerking, the failing rage, the impossible thrusts of energy that imploded out of a seemingly harmless part of my life. Flashes and spattering remnants invaded my thoughts. I shuddered from head to toe. My breathing strained once more. I raised a digit, pressing it against the door. I pushed it forward. It creaked inwards a foot or two. My foot followed. As it trusted on my carpet, my big toe felt the flex of fluid, adjusting to my stance. I ventured until I was beyond the doorway, standing beside a spot I had bared witness to the final horrors of that night. Or so I thought. There it was, still motionless. My heart seemed to be demanding more space in my chest with each inch I covered across the floor. Despite my inner terror, and the tears and confusion in my eyes, I managed to proceed. My mind's eye told me there was no other option for me. There seemed no sense in running or calling out anymore. If I had stopped back then to think about it, I may have questioned the state of my fright. But looking back, I know why I knew where to go. It hurts to understand. It will torture me to the end of my days. My hand came up to my side, still quivering. My mattress began to get cleaner amongst the shadows. My eyes were still adjusting from the light of the hall. Then it dawned on me. The light switch. I turned back slightly and reached out. With the click of the room, I was brought out of darkness. It stung for a moment, but I managed to blink off the effect. Looking ahead of me, I wish that I had not done so. The yellow haze showed up the aftermath of the traumatic night all too clearly. Somehow turning on the light had brought my senses to a new level. Nothing could be hidden from my fragile mind anymore. And now the stench with gut-wrenching power could be directly connected to the source. I swallowed back, sick in my mouth. My eyes watered as I stared underneath the blink of the god-awful mess facing me. Colors of the crisis were not as significant to me at the time that they are now. Both reds clashed with patches of dark on every part of my once safe haven. Decay filled the air with a reek that hunched me over. As I brought up dessert, I suddenly began to shake all over. But this was not just fear, it was becoming rage. It boiled up in my chest as I tilted my head up towards the crime scene. I suddenly burst out in a violent accusation. I screamed at my bed in disbelief. My head spun as I questioned reality, feeling a new source of energy. I clutched at a pencil pot and hurled the mass of gore. I burst into tears from the frustration. I fell to my knees and wept out of complete helplessness. I felt no comfort in the silence. My head hung at the foot of my bed. As a tear dropped to the floor, my eye caught a glint. Light was hitting the smallest hint of something. I leaned up to get a better look through my teary gaze. It was sticking out of the split seams of the mattress, lifting one knee as if I was proposing. I leaned in and examined it. The smell seemed to be more distant now that I was distracted by this item. It hung from the gap in the material. It dripped with... I was still not sure. At least that's what I told myself. I guess I knew even then. As a child, our parents work hard to build us up for the real world. And one thing many of them teach us is that sometimes we have to put certain things to the back of our mind. I was taught that given circumstances when things seemed 
unfair or too overwhelming to bear, that sometimes blurring reality was my lifeline. This was meant to aid me through my homework, teach me a lesson in the long run, but now it took effect within me, and I was aware that this was one of the most treasured lessons my father had ever taught me. I felt the warm hint of pride that I had always treasured when I saw the glint in my father's eyes. The sign that let me know, in my young soul, that he was proud of me. My hand touched the surface of the mattress for the first time in what seemed like hours. It was moist, and it was red. It slipped my finger beneath the protrusion. I curled it up tightly and pulled. The mattress burst. I was swept over by a torrent of juice. My torso deflected a large portion into my eyes, while falling back. I was hit by solid bulks. Things slid by me, scraping my arms and knocking against my head, and my hand was still clenched to the object, in question. Sitting up, I brought my free hand to rub my face. I could not yet see, as I stumbled up, spewing warm fluid between my teeth. I was dripping in it. I smeared it away from my eyes and blinked firmly to get the room into focus, but before I could muster the ability to see what lay around me, I first had to get over the taste. The safety of my mind was no longer available, as the taste once again confirmed what the substance was. As I was still young back then, I'd suffered many a bruise and a cut. I was no different to any other boy my age, aside from my infantile clinginess. Seeing your own blood put curiosity in a boy, learning of the world around them. I had of course sucked upon the cut on my finger before. I had always remembered the first time I had tasted that. Here it was again, in a volume I dare not dwell beyond this recollection. My room was rendered unrecognizable to me, as I my sight betrayed what was left of my mental stability. Gore lay around me. It covered my feet. It gathered in every crevice of my floor. It hung from me like a garnish. My hair was splattered in very inconsistencies, unable to close my eyes from the fear of blood invading my sockets. I had no choice but to stare in sheer repulsion at hell on earth. Now that adrenaline was circling my system, I could see every spreckle. For the first time, I could see what the larger obstructions had been within the once heaping mass. While splinters of bone were spread around me in a soup of internal organs, the heat of the concoction hit my nostrils as strips of rotting meat simmered in its unique recipe. I spotted a length of intestine coming from the rest of my foot on the desk. As my wide eyes jerked around the floor, they felt a heartbeat away from erupting from my head. An eyeball greeted my stare as it reached the rim of the doorway. I felt a pain from my arm. I looked down to my side. My hand was clasping the metal object so tightly that it was tearing at my skin. My artificial motions brought my hand up inches from my face. The trickling of blood from my damp hair left a terrible stream down the back of my neck. I tried to release my grip. Like vices, my fingers separated from the metal leaving it rested on my palm, and I stared at it. I stared harder and even harder. It was a necklace, a necklace made up of a chain. On the chain was a symbol. The symbol was a name. I looked up. Mom? Dad? In the dark of that room, I could swear to this day of one fact from all of its horror. Regardless of all the torment in my life that followed, the investigation, the therapy, the tear through my life that is never sealed, despite everything up to this point where I find myself now recalling this to you, I still remember the faintest, inaudible detail of that night. I heard a dark, deep voice whisper to me, perhaps within my own head. Its only words left a simple message to me. One that I can never seek redemption for. In that room, I heard the first and last time someone or something whisper to me and me alone. Close enough for you?